On the traditional CPA services side, we do a lot of traditional things you might imagine, but we do them with the crypto flavor. Uh, we do them for Bitcoin miners, uh, for crypto projects, for individual investors and the like. So basically every sort of segment that's within our broader crypto industry here. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. I'm Jared, and today I'm joined by Noah and Nick, who are co-founders of The Network Firm, which is a tax firm that is totally about digital assets, crypto, Bitcoin. And today, well, obviously, we're going to touch upon how that impacts Bitcoin mining when it comes to tax season. If you are US-based, or even if you're not US-based, but you are a US citizen, you need to think about taxes at least once a year. And obviously, if you have a company, you may be thinking about it up to four times a year, depending upon how you're filing your taxes. So this episode is super salient for you. Well, let's dive right in. Uh, Nick and Noah, thank you for joining. Noah, if you could, could you give me an outline, your quick elevator pitch of what the network firm is? Happy to. Yeah, thanks for having us. Like you said, we're all about it. Uh, so. Crypto and digital assets, we're all about it. Um, yeah, the network firm is uh, the only 100% digital assets and crypto focused CPA firm uh, in the world, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, uh, and definitely in the US. So, uh, you know, we are, like you said, we do uh, some tax related work, but we're a little bit more broad than that. So, to give you kind of the full landscape, uh, the firm is a traditional CPA firm, accounting firm in many ways. Uh, but it's also a hybrid technology firm. So on the traditional CPA services side, we do a lot of traditional things you might imagine. Yeah, supporting tax preparation type of work, uh, financial statement audit, uh, limited, you know, specific types of a test work, audit readiness, advisory, um, outsourced accounting. So we do all of these things, but we do them with the crypto flavor. Uh, we do them for Bitcoin miners, uh, for crypto projects, for individual investors and the like. So basically every sort of segment that's within our broader crypto industry here. Um, and we're a hybrid of a technology firm. We won't talk about this in a lot of detail today, but uh, I call us a hybrid because uh, we also are very uh, interested. Maybe some of us, uh, some of the listeners that know our background know that we've been involved in the innovation of CPA services at the intersection of uh, digital assets for a long time. And uh, those things include essentially proof of reserves or all the different flavors of proof of reserves. Um, one way to think about that is tech enabled attestation. So that's a big part of the firm. That's sort of the other half of the firm is, uh, yeah, is innovating in CPA services that are directly tailored to the needs of this crypto industry, right? So uh, Bitcoiners should very much care about proof of reserves. I think I care about it. Uh, you know, even mined coins that are held on exchanges, even periodically, right, for liquidations and the like, uh, we should care about those crypto assets and whether they're reserved in like kind, you know, 100%. Uh, those are very important issues that probably a lot of us dealt with uh, towards the end of 2022. So, yep, that's a not so quick overview of the network firm. That was a good overview. And pardon me just saying you guys only do taxes. That is clearly not what you guys do. I think for me, not being a CPA and not being in taxes or, or any part of that part of a business, if that makes sense. You know, I have my own personal CPA who's been helping me out for years. And so I just kind of just assume he's the tax guy, but he also does much more than just that. And so your firm does a lot of different stuff. And actually you threw out a word that I think I want to dive deeper on. If you could, when you say kind of innovative strategies, what are the ways since you've founded the firm? Like what are things that have evolved and changed outside of just maybe like like nothing to do with the IRS and nothing to do with what the government is asking or maybe the, the practice and standards that you guys have to do as CPAs. But what are things that have maybe evolved in crypto or Bitcoin or even Bitcoin mining that has maybe forced you to change some of your uh, modus operandi or just allowed you guys to maybe create a better client uh, experience? For sure. There's, there's a bunch. Um, we think of, you know, sort of 2009, 2010, the advent of the Bitcoin network is actually a, a paradigm shift in, in finance, in accounting, in asset ownership, in asset registry and tracking. Um, and I think that that thesis that we believe that is true is, is proven out over the years, uh, especially as you see, you know, the advent of smart contract platforms, the tokenization of real world assets, stable coins obviously being the largest use case uh, today and a pretty powerful use case. Um, all of these innovations in the digital asset industry and crypto industry uh, 
they create opportunities, of course, for service, right? So a company who does X, Y, Z, it's a company who mines, it's a company who, uh, you know, uh, provides mining facilities, but maybe gets paid in Bitcoin. All of these business models in some way have crypto flowing through the, the balance sheet and through the income statement. And so sort of when crypto is on the balance sheet, you now have a new challenge uh, for a CPA, an accountant, any sort of advisor. They're going to need new tools, uh, new understanding, new uh, and hopefully some experience once they get going on it um, to be able to handle the needs, essentially, to be able to get the right outcome for the client. So um, audit was really the first one that we as individual co-founders uh, ran up against, which was uh, for a large exchange today, they're uh, the U.S.'s largest exchange by volume. But when we first started working with them, uh, they were you know a small startup in San Francisco, and we were there to you know service a financial statement audit engagement. Well, how the heck do you do that? You know they're earning fees in all of these different crypto pairs. They've got customer assets. Where do those live? How do those play into the financials? How do you test you know that they actually have it and own it? You know how do you Look at historical transactions. You can't call, you know, you can't call Bank of America and say, "Hey, does this startup actually have this bank account balance?" Right? You, you need, you need tools, and so that's the stuff that we've developed over the years. Um, I could go on, but I think asset tokenization is the other one. Right? There's this huge transparency gap that gets created. It's great that you can tokenize gold and other commodities. It's great that you can tokenize uh, dollars and treasuries, uh, but what about that real world component? Is it really there? Uh, is it in like kind? Is it properly valued? These are all the kind of key like CPA accountant type assertions, things that we care about, right? Um, that need to be con connected to the on-chain world. And so, uh, again, I could go on to talking about how we do that with technology, um, but that's probably the topic for a whole nother podcast. No, that was great. I just, the story in my head is that so much has changed since you guys founded this business and i'm sure so much is changing year on year i mean even i feel that there's going to be pretty big advances in the way bitcoin is even run over the next two to four years just based on some of the stuff that people are even saying i think that that may even influence the way you guys are even thinking about bitcoin among the entire digital asset landscape but what i'd love to do today and i think we've already done some work behind the scenes to kind of prepare for this Let's go ahead and let's kind of break down what are the reasons why, you know, people need to be thinking about tax considerations for Bitcoin miners. Um, Nick, I'm going to throw it to you. If you could you lay out the two simple, uh, I guess, I want to say taxable events, but maybe they are taxable events that Bitcoin miners really need to be keeping in mind as they think about staying, I guess, tax compliant. Yep. Staying out of jail, right? Got to pay your taxes. So <laughs> applies to all of us. Uh, yeah, there's really, you know, there's two situations with Bitcoin. You're mining Bitcoin, right? You earn Bitcoin rewards when you're mining. You've got a taxable event, right? You've earned income for a service. And so that is your first bucket. And then the second, because the IRS has dubbed Bitcoin and crypto as property, um, it is taxed again when you dispose of it. And dispose of it can mean selling for fiat or just spending your Bitcoin for goods and services. So those are your two situations and they're taxed differently. So when you earn Bitcoin via mining, it's gonna be taxed the fair market value of the Bitcoin when you earn it. So if you mine a Bitcoin at 58K, that's your cost basis and you have 58 grand of income and that'll be taxed at ordinary income tax rates, which you know you can the, the audience can search those tables. Those will be dependent on where you fall in the brackets. Um, and then the second piece, as we said, is when you dispose of that Bitcoin. So let's say Bitcoin's at 60K and you're going to buy, uh, maybe you're going to buy new machines with it. And so you've got to take the cost basis of 58 grand, compare that to your selling price of 60. You've got two grand of a gain and that'll be taxed at the capital gains rates, which again, you know, range anywhere from, uh, I think it's like 5% to 15%. They adjust them every year, but you'll have to look at where you fall and it'll be dependent on the individual. Yeah, great. Thank you for breaking that down. And then I think something that's often asked and we outline it here is, you know, is income from Bitcoin mining double taxed? So do you want to touch upon that? Because that is something that I've heard often and, you know, be, before hopping out with you guys and kind of diving into this. So do you want to touch upon that and maybe break some myths? Yeah. I mean, it's a myth and it isn't right. Cause as I laid out, you, you do have the situations of, you earn it and you're taxed once. So you're not, you know, double tax on the earning per se, 
Um, but when you spend it, you have that capital gains consideration. So, um, you know, that, that really is what we're talking about. And, and again, I think people, you know, Bitcoiners, right? We view this as better money. We plan to be using it eventually. It's not just hold and wait forever. Eventually, we think we'll be using this in our everyday life. So your brain naturally makes that association of, well, I get paid a paycheck, I pay income on it, and then I don't think about it again. Um, you know, and as you alluded to at the start of how we think about things differently, you know, tracking on-chain Bitcoin transactions here and there is one thing. And then with Lightning and thinking about people actually spending, you know, Bitcoin every day on doll on coffee, packs of gum, like that's a whole nother equation from a tax perspective. And until they, you know, until something changes from a tax law, it, that's going to be the case of needing to track it and having to track for the purpose of, yeah, that capital secondary capital gains tax when you do actually use it. And not time for a new tea party um, or, you know, <laughs> awesome tea party, but it's, um, but yeah, there's also sort of the corporate considerations too, right? I mean, this cuts across any industry, right? Corporations pay uh, a federal corporate rate um, and depending on their domicile, um, where they sell goods and services, et cetera, they're going to pay uh, state uh, and local taxes as well. Um, but then they distribute what? They distribute, you know, part of their income uh, as paychecks, right? Or dividends, and those are also taxed. So there's, you know, inherently a couple layers even um, in, in the corporate side as well. Yeah, as someone who is a hodler at this point, I don't think I've ever spent any Bitcoin, even though I have had good reason to spend Bitcoin per some of the philosophies I've kind of touched, you know, touched upon with some other company's employees. Like, you know, like the thing is, if it is money, we should be spending it. But I think knowing that I've never really moved it just because of that, because it is a taxable event. You know, I don't want to go pay a five dollar cover to go into a Bitcoin club or something. Let's just use that. You know, I have it on lightning, like you just said, Nick. And it's like, OK, I've done this. And then I have to think about, OK, when did I buy that Bitcoin or that sats, or, you know, those sats and what was my cost basis and then maybe what was my capital gain. And so unfortunately, I think for people stateside, and I think that that's why I know many people that huddle myself included just because we don't we're, we're trying to avoid taxable events. Right. And uh, I do think that that is something that El Salvador has right now over the rest of the world where people can use because I don't believe at least El Salvador. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe it's seen as property you know, because it has been basically ordained uh, a national currency or something, you know, like you said, legal tender. Get yeah, tender. Legal yeah, tender. Yeah. Legal tender. That's the word I was looking for. You know, when, just like you said, people get their, their income and they're like, Oh yeah, the taxes are taken out. They're not even thinking about it. Right. Cause they're just W2. Um, and I think people who really think about taxes are people who have LLCs or S corps. And so maybe we could talk about that kind of dichotomy, right? Mining as a business for the miners or someone who's maybe mining just as a hobby. Um, maybe you've got some ASICs out back and you're earning some Bitcoin um, versus, you know what, you have ASICs out back, but you've also set up an LLC to cover yourself. And maybe there's some tax advantages there. So could you guys kind of talk about that mining as a business versus mining as a hobby? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the the hobby distinction isn't necessarily one that's tax determinative. So, you know, I think the the right sort of terminology or way to frame this would be to sort of lay out maybe from simple to more complex how you can go about this. Um, and so let's call the most simple use case sort of individual investment, sole proprietor, you know, um, cell phone sort of business activity, but with no corporate entity. Uh, you're just, like you said, doing this at home. Uh, maybe your wife and significant other doesn't care, you know, that the garage is sounds, you know, like uh, whatever, like there's a jet plane inside of it. Um, or you're using a service like Compass and, you know, you're using a qualified service provider to do the hosting, right? But you're still, it's this business investment activity. Um, that's kind of the simple side. Um, and uh, there are benefits to that, right? Uh, but mainly it's just you're not uh, having to deal with any of the tax complexity that comes to sort of these next levels of putting entity, putting this ent uh, activity through an entity and then, uh, the other tax reporting and record keeping obligations that come with that. So uh, the big downside of that is if you're doing really any significant activity, especially like paying your own power bill at 25 cents a kilowatt or something, um, you know, that's uh, the type of expense that once put into sort of a business frame can be a deductible expense. Um, and that makes a big difference. Um, and so, you know, sort of going up in the levels, trying to, you know, there's, Again, we could do an hour just on corporate structure and tax impacts, but let's, uh, you know, sort of next up from that would be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a simple LLC 
Um, uh, even actually not, right? You could even even uh, do uh, self-employment income. So you can schedule your taxes as self-employed or you know partially part of your activity is self-employed. You might have some W-2, but it's sort of like, hey, I've got my own home business over here as well. That gets reported on a Schedule C. Um, and if it's, you know, sort of if you can show that you've got actual sort of uh, sufficient management um, in the business, you're actually running a business qualified, um, then, yeah, you can benefit from those deductible expenses. They go on a Schedule C in the tax return. Uh, if you can't do that, again, all of those expenses paid out, you know, they're just they're losses to you. They're not recapturable in a, in a tax benefit. Going up from there, there's putting a structure around it, putting an LLC uh, or electing an S corp, a pass through uh, sort of uh, treatment, which again hits the tax return in a, in a pretty similar way. It's going to give you some liability protection benefits, things like that. Uh, you know, if I don't know your neighbor's kid uh, runs into your your uh, your mining rigs or something and sticks their finger in the fan, I don't know. Um, so yeah, there's some other benefits that aren't tax, um, and then up from there. Um, maybe around that area, you've got partnerships, right? I mean, uh, this is one potential vehicle that's very good for Bitcoiners that want to come together, combine resources um, and and get into to business together. Um, these are roughly passed through as well, um, but they have a lot of complexities around uh, the reporting uh, aspects, uh, as well as things like when you start to think about, okay, well, are we depreciating assets? Who gets a share of that depreciation? Um, uh, so, yeah, partnerships is kind of a universe of its own with its specific tax reporting. And then you go up to things like a C-Corp, which, you know, is the really more sort of, uh, hey, we're really professionalizing this. We would like to raise money. Um, we can have many investors, um, things like that. Yeah, you talked about depreciation, and I think we're going to come on to that as we move forward. But right now with the network firm, how many Bitcoin miners I guess I want to say not hobbyists, right? We're not going to use that word. I like the way you said simple or complex. How many Bitcoin miners that you know of, and I don't know if you can share this, that you know of that you're supporting right now that have less than, I don't know, five machines or have maybe a smaller investment, if, if I can say. And then of those, how many of them have set up a legal structure and how many of them are don't have a, a legal structure set up? In the domain of what, like, sort of what we're calling hobbyists, like, five five machines or less yeah i mean yeah if you have five machines like let's say you have a couple of clients that have five machines are they set up with a legal structure or are they not set up with a legal structure because i know with the blog that uh we will put in the link of this episode you have a couple sentences here it's like you know since deductions are not allowed when mining as a hobby or you know i don't want to call it simple mining but maybe not mining at scale you can form an llc for accounting to take advantage of deductions um mm -hmm. That's yeah. like a huge sentence within the blog that has been put together that really says, you know, if you want to take advantage of deductions, you should set up a, a structure. So I guess what I'm also trying to ask without asking it, but I will now, is at what point would you at the network firm, would y'all be like, hey, I think it's time for you to set up a structure, right? Yeah. Is, there, is there a number of ASICs that you want online or how, how, did, how are you thinking about that? It it's, inter it's an interesting framing, right? I mean, I don't know that we look at a number of basics and we could just, you know, from experience over the years, maybe the hobbyist comes to us because, hey, I've been mining, I need to report income. It's just, I've had a couple machines up. And really for us, I think it's, we look at that, what is the actual exposure of income? Like how much are you actually earning? And, you know, let's just say they're turning it on and off because, you know, maybe they're in a, a warmer climate, so they, they need to turn them off every now and then, or just their electric bills got jacked up and it's been only on a few months. Stick to hobby, we'll report the income, but hey, you know, you're heating your garage with it and, you know, still a hobbyist to some extent, but you've got a number of machines heating a garage, they're running all year and you've got decent income from it. That's where the analysis from us is simply, hey, you need to start deducting, you know, you're spending them, if you're running them all year, you're losing out on not taking advantage of those deductions as Noah called out, right? Of the electricity costs, the machines themselves, uh, the depreciation that comes with it. So that's, that's really the analysis from us less so of how many machines it's more of what is that actual income exposure? And, you know, are you going to continue to do this? Um, even if you're not going to scale it per se, but you're just going to keep four machines running all year. Maybe you've got one of the black boxes, right? From upstream, you got it at your house and you plan to keep two miners going all year then, hey, let's take advantage of those deductions so you can start to, uh, you know, A, limit your tax liability and B, just build that business, build the deductions and 
keep your exposure a little lower there. Yeah, that yeah. that makes total sense. I think that was a great answer. I know I was trying to get you to say like, if you have six A6 and not four A6, maybe you would do it, but you're totally right. It depends on everyone. And Noah, you said a number there that I hope the Bitcoin miners have woken up from that number when you said 25 cents a kilowatt, because I know that's impossible to mine on profitably. I'm up in Massachusetts currently where, yes, we had the tea party, as you called out. And, you know, 22 cents, I think, residentially, 23 cents we get here. But most of the public miners are a couple cents, you know, uh, in order to find profitability. So I wanted to talk about depreciation. You had mentioned that, Noah. And for many people who are listening to this, a lot of the reason why investors get into real estate is because of that, that word, right? Depreciation. How can we take advantage of this as we move forward? And with mining hardware, could we talk about that? Could you give some examples of how depreciation could work uh, for people that are, you know, have ASICs up and running, whether they're hosted with us at Compass or they're listening and they're doing it at home, or maybe they have an entire facility and an entire structure, but they haven't been taking advantage of the depreciation factor of Bitcoin mining. Yeah, for sure. I like anything else, it might be a set of trade-offs, you know, and so I think you just want to approach it knowledgeably. Um, and just cutting to one of them might be, you know, taking a depreciation sort of benefit now, depreciation expense now, um, but then selling, let's say, let's say you choose to turn over a miner, maybe it's not the most efficient and you'd like to upgrade to a more efficient miner that just came on the market. You sell that old miner and you've taken some depreciation expense on it, um, there's going to be a tax impact for doing that. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but just depreciation is a, a general topic, right? Um, this is a, a tax, you know, a theory and methodology that, that IRS has multiple forms of um, that relate to sort of the usefulness of business assets, right? Um, and so there's a lot of uh, schedules to this, you know, um, and categories. So across, you know, sort of uh, other industries, you know, mining and farming and manufacturing and service, et cetera, right? You've got these different categories that IRS has set out. Um, and you can fairly, uh, you know, put an ASIC sort of in the computer hardware um, sort of bucket. Uh, and they lay out, you know, sort of these are uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, whatever, up to 29 for real estate type thing, depreciation schedules. Um, and now you get to, okay, well, how do we depreciate assets? And there's two things to this. Also, there's a fork in the road. There's there's depreciation for accounting, right, purposes, and there's depreciation for tax reporting purposes. And so this is definitely where you kind of want to get help. If this isn't something you do on a daily basis, you probably uh, want to talk to a buddy who knows about it. Um, you know, let's say you have a partnership, right? Let's say, hey, a couple guys get together. We'd like to mine together. We'd like to be in this thing together. Let's make the, you know, let's allocate some assets, have some fun with this. From an accounting perspective, you can keep books and records for that partnership, when it comes to tax time, you talk to your tax CPA and the numbers uh, on your taxes are probably going to look a bit different, you know, than, than your accounting. Um, and, and depreciation is one of those areas where this is true. Um, so there's a whole, there's a number of different options. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, section 179 is a tax and jobs act, uh, animal that's been created. This is, um, essentially an accelerated depreciation, um, taking you know, the full value of the asset, the purchase price of the asset and sort of moving it into the first year, getting the whole benefit of that. Um, there's also bonus depreciation, which is um, <clears throat> similar. Um, uh, the Section 179 has some very specific benefits to it uh, in terms of the categories of assets and, and things like that. Um, bonus depreciation is a more general concept, allows you again to advance this depreciation into a single year. Um, well, a single year for 22, 100%. It's gone down on a schedule 20% every year. So I think for 2024, it'll actually be 60%. Um, but anyway, advance a significant amount of, of depreciation expense into year one, and then you um, trickle it in th through the prior years. The stuff that you learn in accounting 101 is straight line depreciation. That's, hey, we bought you know a tractor for the farm, and it's got a nine, seven, five or seven year useful life, and we just divide the total purchase price by seven and we take that expense for it every year. Um, and yeah, so depreciation generally, yes, this is a benefit. Why? And for the, those that don't do accounting every day and, and want the simplistics, right? Your, your tax is made up, uh, it's taxable income, right? That's not how much Bitcoin you mined or how much revenue you earned on the top line of a company. Um, it's actually... Uh, that revenue, less cost of goods sold, 
less general GNA expenses, less things like depreciation to reach net income. And that's your taxable number, right? Um, but beware also, side note for folks that have LLCs that choose the LLC route, there is a, um, there's a state tax as well, state and even local, right? Which can be uh, gross receipts tax. So it could be a percent on the top line. And there's also net, you know, income tax states as well that are taxed on the bottom line, you know, with depreciation and other expenses in, taken into account. So um, yeah, big benefit, but it's all about planning. Again, this is a long topic here, so I'm going on and on, but um, it's all about planning. So a lot of people think about tax as, uh, you know, what is it, April? Oh God, it's March, you know, get everything together, get my 1099s, get this to the CPA. I don't want to deal with it. If you're doing anything professionalized, uh, especially in the mining space, if you're uh, working in concert with others in a partnership or an LLC, uh, it's, it's not a backward looking exercise. I mean, it is for compliance, but planning is a forward looking exercise, right? I think we all know that from the general word itself. Planning is a forward looking exercise, right? And so <clears throat> taking into account things like I mentioned this example of, hey, are you going to turn over miners? Let's say it's a partnership that says we're going to deploy 10 or 15 miners. Um, you know, our strategy is to kind of get good pricing on these assets to be these miners to begin with by buying some slightly used machines. But then, you know, once we get our feet under us, we're going to upgrade to new machines. Well, you're going to know then in year two, if you take a bunch of depreciation on all those first 10 or 15 miners, what's going to happen in year two when you sell them uh, is you're essentially going to be paying both income and potentially capital gains tax on the sale of those miners. If you don't have that in your plan, that's a big surprise to your partner and potentially yourself, right? Because you think, hey, look how good we did the first year. We got all this wonderful depreciation expense. Our bottom line was was good or we got to break even and above in year one. This is great. Year two, you sell some miners and you've, you've sort of backed all of that out of year one into year two unexpectedly. Yeah, I'm glad you touched upon the selling of miners and what is going to happen there because depending upon when you buy your miner, you may be getting it really cheap or you may be getting it way above what you know MSRP was six months before you bought it. And this just obviously has to do with the cycle. And right now we're in a place where you know, buying TerraHash is still pretty cheap. And in fact, we have a promo, I guess I want to call it, up right now where you can buy 10 S21s. And I will leave that link in the description as well because it's like kind of a great time. There's obviously not financial advice, right? But it's kind of a good time if you look in the peaks and valleys of hash rate and overall sentiment. And obviously Bitcoin prices drives most of this to invest in miners. And there are people who will buy a miner today Let's say they spend $5,000 and ideally at the peak of the bull run, which should be hopefully next fall, they'll be able to sell that miner for $10,000 maybe. And so can we talk about, just use that example and talk about the tax con considerations around selling miners. We've kind of talked about how we can depreciate on the hardware, but let's live in the world now where you're going to sell. And I think you touched upon it too, with your example, you're going to sell a miner that hardware is actually going to be worth more to the market. So you're going to actually probably have a capital gains uh, event, right? Yeah. Maybe. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe is the right answer. Okay. Uh, why, why, why maybe? <laughs> you got well, that. I'll let Nick answer, but just the first quick distinction is individual versus a business, right? So, you know, um, an individual purchasing and selling a miner, you know, it, it, it's not a capital asset of a business, right? Whereas um, in, in a business sense, yes, it's very much a capital asset. So, yeah, no, I, Exactly. That's what I was going to lead with the, the hobbyists, right? We're going to separate them here because they won't really be able to take advantage much other than, hey, if they if they sold it for more, the IRS would expect them to report that income, um, but it's not a capital asset. So, you know, going to the, the person who's moved on, they want to take advantage of the depreciation deduction. So they formalized a bit um, to your point. Yeah, they, they buy a miner very, very much like buying that secondary impact of Bitcoin itself. Right. What is let's say they bought a machine for 30 grand. Um, they've depreciated $5,000 worth of it, and now they're going to sell it for 31. So um, you take your new cost basis, which will be what you bought it for, less depreciation. So in our example, it's now at $25,000. they are selling it for 31, so they've got a $6,000 gain. But as Noah alluded to at the end of the depreciation um, explanation there, the IRS is going to recapture that depreciation deduction when you sell it. So that 5,000 of, of the $6,000 gain is going to be taxed at ordinary income rates and then leaving the taxpayer with 1,000 of capital gains tax. Um, obviously, 
confusing trying to use a very simple example there but to Noah's point I mean that is again why planning is so important and why you want to be you know meeting with your CPA much more than a few times or more, much more than that tax deadline because um, you want to think about these things because again that ordinary rate is going to be higher um, in most cases and again can be a surprise if you weren't thinking about it one other thing quickly just on on the network firm too to make clear uh, yes, we're a CPA firm. Nick's a CPA. I jokingly call myself an honorary CPA. Um, I used to practice law before I came to public accounting, so I don't maintain a CPA license, um, but yeah, work actively in this space. So, um, but, but one of the things with working with us is we have a ton of clients that have a trusted tax CPA uh, that they like, but they're not crypto people, right? The, the tax CPA is like, I don't know what you're talking about, but like, give me the right schedules, download these documents and we should be okay. Um, for anybody that trades, you know, uh, has any level of like significant transaction activity, um, that's where we really come in. So that that's our big benefit. On the individual side, we really hyper-focus on the sort of like white glove um, service that's related to basis tracking, uh, you know, helping reconcile each year. Of course, there's all these sort of tax adjacent or tax direct topics that we talk about. What are the gray areas? What are you know things you can do? Um, and those are ultimately client decisions and maybe in partnership with their chosen tax CPA to do the actual compliance filing. But we really just help get all of that really well understood, really well documented. So if if folks have any sort of issue, you know, this is the knock on wood moment, right? Whether um, you know it's, it's an audit in the future. Um, they have a really solid base to come back to, to say, look, I'm a good, you know, I complied in good faith, right? Hired an expert, the whole thing's documented, every transaction is reconciled. There's a full memo that sort of wraps this thing in a bow and just describes how I thought IRS thought about each of these transaction types, you know, from DeFi to, you know, staking and mining income and all the all the other stuff. And uh, yeah, so it's, um, that's kind of how we, we approach it. Yeah, you've talked about planning a good amount here. Uh, the idea of planning is an active thing and it's looking into the future. We talk about year-end tax planning and what are some things that people should be thinking about that maybe they're not thinking about. I mean, I think most people think about this from a traditional standpoint, but when it comes to crypto, is there anything that they should be considering outside of when they're now they're having to do this with crypto or Bitcoin, maybe they haven't had to Think about it before, but in the past, either their 401k or their Roth or their home or something else, some other asset that's been appreciating or maybe not appreciating. What are things that are maybe specific to Bitcoin, crypto, or especially Bitcoin miners? Yeah, I think either of us could go. I'll start with one. Maybe we'll bounce a couple back and forth because there's yeah. multiple. Um, I think the biggest issue for miners, is especially folks that maybe haven't done more than a couple cycles, is the surprise on the income versus quote unquote the sort of balance sheet that you hold um, if you're you know if we're in a bull market and you're sort of riding a nice you know cycle when you start mining right you're you're earning uh you're earning income in coin at the fair market value at the time you receive it right let's say it's being distributed from a pool on a daily basis that's income at the price of bitcoin on that day right and this starts to stack up over the days now um, if you are in a rising market, right, like at the end of the year, let's just say it's been up and to the right for 12 months, right? That'd be great. Of course, we go like this and zigzag. But let's say we end, you know, significantly higher. Your income tax obligation may be very significant. You may not have any cash in hand to pay that income tax obligation. You may only have a bunch of Bitcoin. Well, thankfully, the Bitcoin is at a much higher value than your tax obligation, right? Uh, the unfortunate result, the unfortunate reality is that that is probably the total outlier, like not real example. The more real example is the time that I have earned income, you know, the asset price was, you know, at certain times higher and lower, but net lower, net lower at the end of the year, meaning I've got no liquidated Bitcoin in cash as a tax set aside. I've got a big tax obligation and now I'm forced to sell my Bitcoin at prices that I don't really love. And, and we've seen that just over and over and over. Um, it's unfortunate. So we've got some thoughts about that, some strategies. Um, but yeah, Nick yeah. probably has others. The the other thing I'll call out is right to Noah's point on that right record keeping. Like, do you have a good picture of that cost basis of what you're actually sitting on and how that looks? Do you have your cash in hand managed so you can start to you know allow us to show you? Hey, here's what your estimated taxes are going to be. Are you prepared for that, or do you need to think about liquidating and 
the sooner do you do that, the more ability you have. You know, nobody can predict the market, but you could at least say, all right, I don't, I know I don't want to sell right now. I'm willing to wait to a certain level. Um, and then the other side of it too is maybe to before you even get into liquidating to pay that tax bill. It's like if we exhausted all deduction opportunities, right? Because there's there's an opportunity to donate Bitcoin, right, and get that fair market value, send the Bitcoin direct, avoid. Um, a capital gains potentially, you know, there's certain limits to how much you can get. And, and then there's extra steps that, of course, the IRS will throw in if you're donating more than a certain dollar amount. I think it's like five grand where you have to go then get a, a technical uh, expert appraisal of that value, um, which, again, isn't totally different than just what's the fair market value, but you got to get a third party involved. Um, but the point is, yeah, have we exhausted all those opportunities to make sure that we're taking the tax bill or the taxable income amount? down to as low as it can, you know, within the rules. Have we looked around all the corners and prepared for that? So hopefully we avoid, you know, liquidating outside of what you already planned. Yeah, those are great. And I'm glad you brought up the philanthropic route to lower taxable exposure. That is something that I think people often accredit to the wealthy or high net worth individuals that, oh yeah, they're going to donate to lower their, their tax exposure. But I think in 2025, there may be a whole new amount of people that are now going to be dealing with how do we lower our tax exposure? And so thinking about Bitcoin mining, one of the questions that is always asked is, is it better to buy spot or is it better to mine Bitcoin? And I know that within the blog that I'll say it again is attached in the link below. There's a line that says, you know, Bitcoin mining for high net worth individuals has more tax benefits than buying Bitcoin on the spot. So now I'm going to put one of you in the spot. I'll let you guys choose, but I would love for you to just, maybe dive into that i'm sure it's not black and white i'm sure that there's a little nuance as there has been throughout and there is just surrounding uh, most people's uh, tax strategy so could could one of you talk about that i think we'll kick it back and forth but i bet all the experienced miners listening probably laugh at that one right because as they know it's not just plugging in a machine it's not that simple you know there's a lot of costs and variables that's why we've seen miners come and go um but yeah i mean it's a very specific equation that individual will have to do right is hey am i going to actually put up enough hash rate that you know we're going to formalize it to take advantage of um, the deductions be able to bear that expense um, because it's not always going to be profitable especially at smaller scale um you know it's you're not going to be able to lock in those same rates as the big guys so it's it's very much an equation of is that worth it what's what are the other implications of my my business or my personal income stance and um you know case by case basis but i think all of us from a decentralized bitcoin point want to see more hash rate online right and more dispersed so that's one positive yeah i'm an i'm just an aspirationally high net worth person so i can't really uh give you the high net worth viewpoint here no. um yeah i think it doesn't even have to be like quote unquote high net worth um it's just you know someone um who has sufficient liquid assets, you know, to invest in mining. Um, and then you think, well, if I have sufficient liquid assets and other assets, then it's just the general point of like diversification, right? Um, I mean, it perfectly appropriate for some people to just DCA Bitcoin, like fine, they might be high net worth, but the simplicity aspect of it is like that allows them to get their allocation, gets their diversity, or their uh, diversification sort of checkbox, you know, um, they've got exposure to the space. That's good enough. Um, yeah. For other folks, it might be like, okay, a little more sophisticated, willing to sort of go to the next level uh, and allocate those assets sort of upfront, right? Upfront, um, earn, earn coin at a lower uh, fair market value than you would if you were buying it, if you're mining efficiently, hopefully that's true, right? Using a service provider that can get you decent power rates, not mining at home necessarily for most of us. Um, then yeah, that can be a totally valid strategy. And again, you put that in sort of the right corporate entity or the right tax strategy um, where you can capture deductible expenses by doing that. Yeah, that that can work. Um, but yeah, it's upfront, uh, out of pocket, it's also creating income, right? And so uh, allocating to Bitcoin uh, in a DCA doesn't create income, right? It's uh, probably taking post-tax income and, and allocating it to Bitcoin. We've just talked about mining Bitcoin, so let's stay there. One of the things that I truthfully don't understand well is the tracking tax basis on mine coins. So 
if you guys could try to explain that and explain it to me like I'm five years old, because that's how I feel about it when I think about it. That would be great. There's uh, a bunch of acronyms that I'm seeing here, and there's some other stuff that is in the blog. But I, sure. I guess when I look at this, is there a strategy that's best for people? Or is this, you're probably going to say, well, it depends on the context. It depends on the person. But is there one that is maybe more used or more common than others? And then maybe why? Yeah, there's a ton to say on this point. Um, there's a whole uh, you know market full right now of, of software providers that have you know, tackled this challenge for many years. Um, so we've worked with just about all of them over the years, tested the software, you know, had clients come to us with the software and used it. Um, it's not a, you know, a software that we ourselves have developed. We're typically using a, an off the shelf tool. And then we've got a couple that we really partner closely with the team, uh, the development leadership team to say, Hey, here are the features that we need. Here's the bleeding edge stuff. That's not working that we need to work. Um, uh, so really a lot of this is dealt with with software so yeah it it you know many years ago was a total pain to try and do any of this on a spreadsheet um and it's unique too right because uh you know people have traded securities for instance for years even if it's uh you know like well robin hood hasn't been around that long in the grand scheme of things but you know if you've been trading securities investing you know in your own uh, self-directed ira or things like that you know that everything is settled in cash. You just work with the broker, you buy and sell, and what do you get? You get a 1099B, there you go. They did FIFO, first in, first out tracking for you. They marked all your capital gain events, all your capital gain or loss events, all of your dividend income events. They roll it into a nice report. They send one to IRS, they send a summary version with all of it to you, and tax is easy. Uh, in crypto land, no, of course, not that easy. Uh, on-chain stuff, multiple wallets, transfers between purchases and sales on different marketplaces. Um, and so, yeah, it can get complicated and get hairy. Um, ultimately, the requirement is a record-keeping requirement. So uh, for your assets, you know, that are subject, personal property, property that's subject to capital gain treatment for its, um, for its disposition or sale, you're, you're required to keep records of that. Um, and there's a couple approved sort of IRS blessed, I guess you could say, um, accounting methodologies uh, or inventory accounting methodologies. Um, and yeah, we've got first in, first out. And then you've got a couple forms of specific identification, which are uh, sort of subsets. Uh, specific ID are true old school spec ID, which is I'm selling different lots of assets and I'm actually pointing to them, so to speak. I'm actually marking them as, hey, this piece of inventory I'm selling, um, you know, and this is hard to do in digital assets because Bitcoin is fungible. UTXOs are roughly fungible, right? And so um, the software does this usually not on sort of pick a lot yourself type spec ID, but on highest in first out or um, last in first out. And so, yes, to your question, it definitely depends um, on the person. A lot of times in crypto, we see HIFO or highest in first out being advantageous, at least in, you know, sort of a short term perspective, right? Because uh, let's take an example of a miner, right? Who is earning coin and they are, you know, let's say they're more operationalized. They're more of a business approach to it. They're going to have to liquidate Bitcoin pretty regularly to pay operational expenses, right? Um, and the closer in time you have uh, those events, the better, honestly. But, uh, but yeah, HIFO typically works, right? Because you're with HIFO, you're either reducing the capital gain or, uh, you know, or minimizing or increasing the loss, essentially, on a disposition. So One addition to this, too, is you know, with the IRS, when you do make that determination to take that approach, they generally want to see you be consistent with it then following years, right? So they're... You're not necessarily able to make that decision and go, well, this year it's better to be hypo. Next year I'm going to go last and first out, for example. Um, you know, there's maybe some unique situations if you can really bifurcate where the coins are in wallets and maybe you can apply different approaches. But with miners, generally they're probably mining, right? Even if it's with a couple pools, it's all going to go to their same operational wallet. So it really becomes difficult to bifurcate and justify the change. So again, going back to planning and thinking ahead, that's something that'll be part of that equation and why you want to work with an advisor to really think about those decisions. Um, so yeah, I'll call that out. And then to Noah's point, and I don't think, I apologize, I didn't touch on this with capital gains, but 
those capital gain buckets are very much driven by short term and long term. So short term being anything you've bought and sold within one year, long term being longer. And they're much more favorable rates long term than short term is. So again, um, to his point, you know, minimizing that gap of price when I got it to sold it within a short term time is even more important. Yeah. Whereas yeah. there you go. Like, for instance, if you want to favor, you know, long term capital gain rates and that's really the focus then FIFO is probably your better methodology net net, right? Whereas if you're just trying to, in the current year, minimize gains altogether, HIFO, um, you know, net gains, which would be the you know, sort of combination of the two, um, then HIFO is net net going to be probably a better approach. So thanks for yeah saying that, Nick. That's a good, good point. This is fascinating. And now thinking about my own crypto tax exposure and whether I'd be HIFO or FIFO, but I'll... Maybe speak to you guys off mic about that a little bit more. I was looking on the website on the networkfirm.com. I'll call it out. Great domain name, by the way. And I believe you guys have been around since 2016. Is that right? No, we've got a, lo a different story than that. It's a long okay. story. Um, most of us have been in the space since 2016 in a professional sense. Um, and the co-founders built uh, what I think was a globally recognized uh, accounting, a digital assets accounting group. Um, at a top 20 CPA firm. So we, we left that, uh, we left that firm in, at the end of 22, uh, January 23, actually. So we're, we're still a baby. I don't know. We're getting to like toddler now. Um, but, uh, yeah, January 23, we, we formed the network firm so that we could basically do more, go unbridled, uh, and focus even further on, you know, what we really believe in, in the space, which is the development of these services, bring sort of the old school stuff into the modern environment uh, in a way that's needed. So Totally misread. I just saw 2016 and I was like, oh, looks like they've been offering services since 2016, but it makes sense. You've been professionally since 2016 and then maybe you guys have even been in digital assets since before then. So I have a question for Nick and then I have a question for Nella. Uh, Nick, you've been in digital assets. I'm not sure how long you've been in digital assets, but is there something you think that, you know, like when you look ahead at the bull run, the incoming bull run, people say we're in a bull run now. It's really tough to tell these days with some of the things we look at in the macro. What is something you're hoping for this bull run and will it impact, I don't know, you know, will it impact the tax code? I, I guess is what I'm, is what I'm looking. If that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. I think it makes sense. I think I get the gist of it. Um, it, it my realist perspective unfortunately is I don't think the tax code changes anytime soon. Um, you know, for the U S specifically to acknowledge Bitcoin as legal tender, like I don't, other than other fiat currencies, they haven't done that. So it's, I just don't have a lot of hopium for that. Um, what I would say is I'd hope we'd get to a point where again, Bitcoin, right. It's not a more favorable, regulatory acceptance of, hey, this should be part of our policy and strategy, right? Bitcoin miners shouldn't be looked at differently than anyone else purchasing energy. That that would be one of my main hopes, right? Is that, hey, people buying it, there should be an even playing field for if you want to buy energy. Once you buy it, you go do with it what you please. And there's not a, oh, well, you're mining Bitcoin, so I'm going to either put a different tax or tariff on it, something like that. Um, you know, and I guess I'll put one other additional on it that we get to a place where peer-to-peer -peer or your own personal wallets are not something that becomes a scope of reporting, right? Of, hey, if I'm going to send Bitcoin to my own wallet and then pay, you know, you for some service for a hundred bucks or just pass Bitcoin that I don't have this fear of, well, now I have to report all of it. Um, you know, not not saying reporting my income, but just reporting the activity. You know, let's let's keep self-custody. It's own, just like I have cash in a wallet and I, I go around and spend it as I please and don't have to worry about you know, just reporting or sharing that information. I think that's my other hope is that we move away from this. This it's just talks right now. There's no no real rules, but it does seem like we're headed towards a way of with KYC ML that they're going to want to, you know, put people that just create wallets ledger, for example, they're going to have to start reporting things and whatnot. So let's hopefully avoid that. <laughs> yeah, with, with that question, I was basically trying to see: is there like something you guys are? looking ahead at the bull run and you're like, wow, if that happens, I don't know, Bitcoin hits 300,000, 400,000, some of these higher upper limits that some of the financial institutions and some of the other bigger voices in the space have kind of called out as possibilities in 2025. Like if it would be enough that they'd be like, okay, we need to really rethink how we 
tax Bitcoin. And then I know I wanted to ask you, you know, if you were in charge of the IRS, which I don't know, maybe that's in your future. You do have a, a law degree. Who knows? Right. What is the what is the one thing? And you can feel free to steal from your uh, from your amigo here. What is the one thing that you would say? We're going to put this into and I know this is a tough question, but what's the one law? There's no silver bullet. But what's the silver bullet you would like to see in tax code that would make life easier for CPAs and professionals like yourselves to try to support people to make sure they're tax compliant or just something that you think would help move the space forward in a progressive way to allow Bitcoin and overall digital asset adoption to continue to flourish in the U.S.? Man, Jared, what a question. Um, yeah, the uh, put, a, put a lot of responsibility on me there. OK, gosh, I mean, the tax code is so complex, right? And most people like you have to work with tax CPAs to figure it out, right? If you do anything other than sort of earn W-2 income, like you do anything else, you feel like you need help. Um, that just fundamentally feels wrong to me. And this is against my self-interest as the leader of this firm who earns money, you know, helping people figure out all this complexity, right? But I really wish we could reduce the complexity somehow. Um, and Tax is all about public policy and economics, and it's like macro and micro. It, there's a lot to it, and I don't pretend to know enough to give policy pronouncements. I just wish it could be more simple. Um, for one sort of policy thing, I you know, if I had to tease something out, um, I you know, we help a couple of uh, folks in the UK, and they've got like a little capital gains. Uh, buffer right so they can kind of have cap gains up i think it's right like three thousand thirty five hundred bucks not a huge amount of money at the end of the day but it's a little bit of breathing room for sort of maybe the the new entrant the retail the mom and pop to sort of be you know getting into crypto and, and willing to sell willing to buy and sell without creating a tax headache right they just sort of had this um you know a little bit of a license a uh, little bit of a free ride up until a certain amount i think that makes a lot of sense and it probably helps you know, it's not the type of rule that's going to help, uh, you know, the top 1% or something or create a new loophole. It's kind of an average Joe uh, type of thing that could help. Um, so, yeah, I think um, the other the other thing real quick, which you didn't touch on, but people should know about. Um, it's not necessarily my policy pronouncement, but um, there is um, a uh, the IRS has announced the 1099-DA. Um, so there's a whole lot to this topic, uh, but I referenced earlier the 1099B, right? Again, the brokerage, all the trading happens within the walls of the brokerage. They know the capital gain. They know any capital loss events. They know the income events from dividends. And IRS gets all of that information on 1099B, literally through an electronic system, sort of as it's happening. Um, and they also get the summary report that you read. They don't have that for digital assets. It's been incredibly frustrating to them, I imagine, for compliance purposes. Um, and so the 1099 DA is meant to solve that, right? And that's where a crypto exchange would try and report capital gain and loss and income, let's say staking as a service on the exchange, you, you know, that would be a part of it. Um, the fundamental problem is that they still don't have, you know, you didn't go cash onto that exchange, trade Bitcoin, trade ETH, trade whatever, and then come off in cash, right? So they still don't know the cost basis of the Bitcoin you put on, uh, you know, the Basically that they don't know the transfers right between the brokerages um, or from on chain that you bought years ago and then goes on to an exchange. Um, and because of this, they're trying to um, require wallet by wallet reporting. So for many years, we've helped clients basically universally. It's like this FIFO or HIFO we mentioned, this inventory method gets applied across anything that you do um, universally. It doesn't matter what wallet, what account, Coinbase, Kraken, whatever. It's all the same. Now it's much more account by account. And this they think will sort of help tie the individual reporting um, and tracking to the brokerage reporting. Um, so that's one thing that people need to know about. I believe it's effective for 2025 tax year. I didn't look at this before, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, but it's something to start thinking about. Not all of the softwares that you use support it. Um, the one that we sort of put most clients on does. And so we've started to do that for clients already, get to in this wallet by wallet sort of tracking. So. When you do eventually get that, take a deep breath because, like to Noah's point, it likely will be this like gross up of just activity because they don't know cost or proceeds. And um, there's a similar form even that goes out now that's just this gross. And it, you know, basically yeah. you take a dollar, you buy it, 
buy a dollar, sell a dollar, buy a dollar, sell, it'll say four, right? It'll just report that total. And a lot of people get that, see a tax form with this gross number. And they're like, I didn't net that much, right? I didn't make that much money and have a little uh, a brief, brief, brief state of panic. Um, so my last question before I ask you guys where people can find both of you is, can you pay for your services using crypto or Bitcoin? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Love to hear that. I love to hear that. Well, now uh, either one of you, please let us know where we can reach out and find you because someone's listening to this who's like, you know, I think I need to be a little bit more buttoned up, right? So I've called out the network firm.com. Great website. You guys got a lot going on there. Um, is that the best place to reach you? I think you're also on a couple of social media uh, places. I don't know if there's an email. What's the best way to start someone's relationship with uh, the network firm? So many apps, so many ways to reach us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the network firm.com, pretty easy to remember, pretty good spot to go. You can see a detail of some of the services we talked about today. You can also hit the button and just schedule a call. You can put a call right on our calendars. Uh, happy for people to do that. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can find the network firm on Twitter. I'm at, uh, at BTC M E P L Z for Bitcoin for me, please. Um, a couple of the other guys are on Twitter. You can find them. Uh, the network firm is on Twitter. Uh, so Feel free to DM us there or on LinkedIn. But yeah, candidly, hit us through the website, hit up client care at the networkfirm.com. And uh, that's the best way to, to get in touch with us. And then I'm on LinkedIn as well and Twitter at Triple Entry CPA. Um, and to know his point, site's always good, but always open to a DM and always looking to meet Bitcoiners, uh, regardless of if they need help or not, just want to chat, learn what they're doing. There's always, I mean, being in the space so long, it, it feels like we've seen everything, but then I'll, I'll meet someone who's doing something I didn't even think about, um, which is always awesome. So I'll go ahead and I'll put all of the links. I'll put both of y'all's uh, personal Twitters as well, because I think that for Bitcoiners, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of pseudonymous people and it's just easier for them to just hit you on Twitter than maybe give you an email or something else. So that's a great way to start. Um, thank you for all that information. If you're watching this on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. And as Noah said, too many socials. We are on X, which was Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Follow us at Compass Mining for all the content we're creating. Nick, Noah, thank you so much for hopping on and talking about the uh, network firm. Our pleasure, Jared. Thanks. Yep, our pleasure. Thanks, Jared.